Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Gym Masters Show, live entertainment lifestyle variety talk show series. How are you doing today? Hope you're doing well. If you're not, stick with us. We're going to entertain you, inspire you, and have a good time together as we do on our entertainment lifestyle variety talk show series. It's always cool to have you guys here from wherever you're watching around the world. We have an international audience watching here in the United States where the show comes from and our neighbors to the north in Canada, to the south in Mexico and South America. Australia, New Zealand, Africa, Asia, Europe, everywhere, up, down, east, west, north, south. So great to have you here. It's been a busy day for me. I was on the air all day today, which tends to be my life in television and radio. I had four radio shows to host and then another television shoot. And then, of course, we're here with you on the Gym Masters Show Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series. Got a really cool guest joining us. Carol Bugay is joining us. Yes, and she's coming in from uh, New York, and she's got some really cool things she's going to tell us about. She's working on a new play that's debuting. She's a prolific suspense novelist, author, as well as a performer and composer and musician. And I'm sure you've seen her books, her novels, you've seen her work uh, on the shelves everywhere. It's, um, she sometimes examines the uh, dark side of human behavior, but in a unique and profound way, which is kind of cool. I know a lot of you are fans of her work, so I know you're excited. And there's different pen names too that she goes under that we're going to talk about. So you may remember actually recognize the pen names even more on some of the actual works. We're going to talk about that. Hey gang, if you would like to comment uh, while the show is on, you can do it right now and uh, do it in our lovely chat room. Uh, feel free, subscribe to our YouTube channel right now at Gym Masters TV. There's no cost to do that. And you can chat right now amongst yourselves. We might even sprinkle a comment or two right here on our screen so the world can see your comment. We may possibly do that uh, if things get busy and we got a lot of comments already built up. So feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, and make sure you click the notification bell so you never miss any of our episodes. And uh, again, if you'd like to comment uh, in our chat room, feel free to do that because the chat room is open and available while the show is live. We call it our JMS Lovity chat room. We got a lot of comments there already. Good to see everybody and welcome to the show. Don't forget to also leave a comment on the episode itself on our YouTube channel. That helps us with the algorithm, YouTube algorithm, that actually is what controls everything. And that lets us get these episodes out to even more people around the world. The billions of people, billion, as uh, was it Carl Sagan from Cosmos used to say, billions and billions and billions <laughs> of people around the world. Again, good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. We're going to dive right into our episode. Keep the comments coming. Thanks for all the great uh, lovity here on our show. And we're going to welcome Carol. First, I want to tell you a little bit about Carol. She's extraordinary. Suspense novelist, author, composer, musician, performer. She's got an exciting new play that is uh, going to be debuting as well. She's got a lot of pen names. She even says too many. <laughs> Carol Lawrence. C.E. Lawrence, Elizabeth Blake. You may know some of her works under those pen names. She has published 15 novels, six novellas, and several dozen short stories and poems. And many of her works appear in translation internationally as well. Winner of both the Euphoria, Euphoria Poetry Competition and the Eve of St. Agnes Poetry Award. She is a two-time Pushcart Poetry Prize Nominee and first prize winner of the Maxim Muzumdar Playwriting Competition and uh, the Chronogram Literary Fiction Prize, Jerry Jazz Musician Short Fiction Award, and the Jean Privea Memorial Fiction Award. She was a finalist in the McLaren, MSU, and Herrico Playwriting Competitions, and also was nominated for a New York Innovative Theater Award. Her plays and musical, musicals have been presented nationally and internationally, and she was also sponsored by the Paper Mill Playhouse for a TCG Playwriting Award two years in a row and was a Playwriting Fellowship finalist at the Manhattan Theater Club. That's just the shortlist, gang. She was also a featured composer at the Broadway Songbook at Lincoln Center, as well as a featured poet in the China Grove Literary Magazine and Quill and Parchment. 
She is uh, also part of international writers retreats and a writer in residence at uh, Birdcliff Art Colony and much, much more. She teaches writing at New York University and Gotham Writers Workshop, as well as the Cape Cod and San Miguel Writers Conferences. She's also a member of the Dramatists Guild, Authors Guild, Sisters in Crime, International Thriller Writers, and Mystery Writers of America. And in her past life, she made a living acting and doing improv comedy. She also founded the Montclair Maulers, the first women's rugby team in New Jersey. That's right. They did not win a single game for three seasons, she said. <laughs> She can often be found hunting mushrooms in the woods or playing Bach on the piano when no one's listening. <laughs> There's a sense of humor. It's cool to have her here, and we've got lots to talk about. We're all excited. Welcome, Carol, to the show, live from New York. Carol, welcome to the show. It's a Hi, pleasure to have you here. You. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. And uh, I also want to, I don't know how to answer the comments in the in the scroll, but thank you for the warm welcome from Crystal and Mer Merlin. Is it Merlin or Merlin? Merlin, yeah, everybody. Yeah. All the comments coming in here from everybody. Yeah. That's so nice, this, thank you. It's for our Lovities, our Jim Master Show Lovities. I was I telling know, I Carol that. about Lovity, and she said she loves that whole vibe and that whole idea of love it it's such it, a great story too slipped out of my mouth yeah and then all of a sudden everybody said i love that word and especially during what everything we've been through you know the yeah. last couple of years which has been really something that's that's yeah. uh that's material for any suspense novel <laughs> oh my gosh yeah. oh. So well, I think uh, I think there's going to be a slew of pandemic novels coming out really soon there probably already are but uh yeah, I think that, you know, it was already a genre, but I think Pete, there's going to be a big audience for it. Yes, absolutely. How did you, now I mentioned uh, improv and comedy and acting and all these other things. Tell us early on, what came first for you? Was it the writing? Was it acting? Was it? Well, actually, I was one of those kids. Like, I would just, like, write, you know, a little little plays when I was, like, I don't know, 10 or whatever. And then I'd, like, assemble all the neighborhood kids, and we'd throw a bed sheet over the um, laundry line out in the yard. And then that would be our curtain. And then I'd all the parents would show up, and we'd do, the, we'd do a show. We'd literally, like, put – we didn't have a barn, but we had a, a laundry line. And, and so, like, I would just – like, any of my cousins, I would make them, you know, be in my shows, my sisters – you know, just just I, I was a, a, a little entrepreneur, a producer, and I, I would write what I thought these were hilarious, scathing, you know, satires about my family in which, you know, the grownups are drinking a lot and playing bridge because that's what you did in Ohio at the time. And so and I thought it was so, you know, and I would have them, you know, saying seven Trump you know, eight spades. And of course, obviously I knew nothing about bridge because that's not a legitimate bid, but I thought it was so, you know, I, I was, I was making fun of my parents, but they were very good. They were really good sports about it. Wow, they pretended to like it. They pretend. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I always had to have thin mints. Like I always had to have, like, there always had to be mints during yeah. intermission for some, for some reason when, when you're 10, that seems like the epitome of like, you know, uh, uh, sophistication and, you know, oh, and yes. I pass around little bowls of, uh, those little pillow mints with the colors. Oh yes. Yes. My aunt would <laughs> always have those so... out on Thanksgiving. Those, yeah, they, they were either right, they were right. like aqua was, green a... or white or pink. In the yes. Bowl, right. That was my, that was my, I, I, right. I was saying, come to my show. There will be refreshments. And what I really meant was there would be mints. There would be mints. Yeah, you know. I mean, do people even do that anymore? I remember growing up as a kid, my mother, I mean, they still go all out for Christmas, but there would be ribbon candy and popcorn balls and like all this stuff oh, yeah, that you that don't stuff, see yeah. anymore. You don't yeah, see any yeah, of that yeah. anymore, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Six different kinds of cookies. I mean, so, um, so this is great stuff. I mean, you have, you're a prolific writer. I mean, you have written so many incredible things. Just show a few of these things on the screen. Uh, and then we can talk about some of them. Some of them go back in time. Some of them are more recent. We're going back a little bit here and sort of working yeah, so our that's, way. That's actually, that was my first book was uh, Sherlock Holmes. The, oh, the, the Star of India, The Haunting of Troy of Abbey was my second one. 
Star of India was the very first one. It was my very first published novel. I was wh what happened was I was writing, um, so I was writing some Sherlock Holmes short stories because I had a, fr a good friend who was an editor, uh, Marvin Kay. He was an editor who published in Doubleday anthologies and also um, St. Martin's anthologies. And so the editor of those books took took me to lunch and said, you know, if you wrote a Sherlock Holmes novel, we'd probably buy it. And I said, um, define probably. Like I need percentages. <laughs> I need percentages. And, um, <laughs> and so we said, oh, 70, 80 percent. I said, okay, that's good. That's good enough. I'll write it. You know, so they bought it. What was this about? A Star of India, it's about the theft of a it actually. There's a beautiful sapphire in the Museum of Natural History, and that's why I that inspired me for the premise. It, it's a beautiful, gigantic sapphire. It's in the gem room, which is one of my favorite rooms. It's got all the minerals and, and crystals and gems and precious. And I just love looking at shiny things. Like, I don't want to wear them. I, I, I'm not interested in jewelry, but I like looking at them, you know? So um, the Star of India is one of the, the, the prominent gems in that room, and so... I sort of looked into the history of it and I decided that it would basically be stolen and Sherlock Holmes had, had to find it. And of course there'd be uh, murders involved. Uh, so, I love that. That's of course, there, yeah, I like to say that. Of course there'd be murders involved. Yes. And then two, here's another one, right? We picked just a few to sort of sprinkle them in this whole uh, series. Oh yeah. So that was my second uh, Sherlock Holmes novel, which takes place in, uh, down in Torquay, actually, which is where Agatha Christie used to hang out, yeah. and um, it's a it's there's an actual abbey, and it's allegedly haunted. But you know, I mean, what what isn't in England? You know, <laughs> well, haunted. Watch out! You know, I mean, everything's haunted yeah. in England. Very um, well done. Have you been to England? Have you had a chance to go over and explore there? Many and, times. Or Scotland, yeah, yeah. Ireland, those areas. I have a lot of ancestry from there, so like my, my little yeah. my little ancestry has like this little circle. You know, like I'm the sort, of, sort of the answer to the question of how white are you? And I'm like very, Scandinavian. very, I'm very white. I'm very Northern. So, but my, like 70% of it is from the British Isles, England and Scotland and Wales. So yeah. Did I've you watch the Queen Elizabeth uh, funeral? I, not so much. I'm not so much a royalist. I'm a little bit more of a socialist, I think. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry she died, but yeah. I'm also, you know, kind of, glad that some of the countries who have felt that they're under the thumb of Britain, you know, are kind of making move moves in the direction of getting, you know, getting more independent. And um, I feel like that's, a, that's a good thing. But I mean, she was clearly an extraordinary woman, not, not to take anything away from her. I did see a few, um, I did see a few minutes of the pomp and I, I, it was breathtaking and people kept saying like, well, yes, you know, the British, they really do pomp better than anyone i'm like you sure do it was amazing when you saw the pop did you also see the circumstance <laughs> like, the circumstance is then death so like if the circumstance is death then you get the pop i get... never could i never was sure what that circumstance thing meant right <laughs> what circumstance the circumstance is someone's died or someone's graduated or someone's getting married i guess who killed blanche dubois <laughs> Oh, so that was um, that was a cozy series that I did for Berkeley Prime Crime. These are also these are all you know early books. Um, now, isn't that the name of um, the character on the Golden Girls? Oh well, that, actually, uh, what's her name played? I guess oh, her uh, first name is Ruma Blanche. Clanahan. I, I I guess I didn't don't really I never really watched the Golden Girls, but I know that yeah, there's a woman named yeah. Blanche. But um, yeah, Blanche Dubois is actually a character out of Tennessee Williams. That's right. And so in my book. Uh, there's this mystery author, and she's a southern she's a southern belle, and she fancies herself kind of like Blanche Dubois, and that's actually her name. And but she kind of, you know, she's she's a bit of a, a, a well, she's a bit of a southern belle, and she yeah. gets murdered. And so, um, and I think that's the character name on the Golden Girls too. Maybe she it, 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 it might have been might have been a. Might have been a play on that yeah. whole thing, you know, because yeah. she was a Southern Belle type thing. And mm -hmm. yeah, isn't that cool? I didn't know that. I didn't realize. I knew there was a woman named Blanche because, you know, I've seen bits yeah. and pieces of the show. Yeah, Rue McClanahan and uh, that whole group. She, she played Blanche? Okay. Yeah. It's a cool cover there too, huh? That's another yeah, nice do, one. 
I did send. Um, okay, yeah. Oh, that's. Tell us that's, about this whole series. This is now series, there's different so, pen names, right? Two people may know your work under several different pen names, and I like the way you say too many pen names. <laughs> yeah, well, it kind of feels that way. So what happened was, um, so one of the reasons I have you do pen names is what genre you're writing in. And so I wrote my first books under just my name, Carol Buguet. But then I started writing thrillers, which which are quite a bit darker than what I had been writing. Blanche you know, Hollingworth Devereaux. That's who her name was on that show. Oh, really? Yes. Maureen oh, obviously really is a golden girl uh, aficionado. Blanche Hollingsworth Devereaux. Holly's, oh, that's such a so great I got name. the D right, the Dubois, the Devereaux. Yeah. I, Devereaux. It wasn't a series that I watched a lot. Um, I liked B. Arthur when she was in Maud. Mm, yeah, Norman she was Lear. great. Yes. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, at the time of this show tonight, 9 p.m. on ABC, an incredible special celebrating the 100th birthday of Norman Lear tonight at oh 9. Oh, my God. And one of my friends, Greg Field, who was mm -hmm. a guest on our show, who's mm -hmm. married to Monica Mancini, Fabulous singer, daughter of Henry Mancini. They were guests. I on the adore show. Henry Mancini. He is such an amazing composer. And He's Monica and her husband oh. Greg, who's an eight-time Grammy-winning mm -hmm. music producer, and he produced all the music for tonight's mm -hmm. airing of this epic star-studded celebration. That's great. Marking 100 years of Norman Lear. I tell you, um, That's cool so stuff. Cool. So uh, this is really fascinating. Tell us about this whole series of. Uh, so this series was this series came about because I had a fellowship. I had a fe I was a fellow. I, I love it. It's like I'm a fellow in a castle yes. in Scotland. And so it was it's basically a writer's retreat. Only they call it the Hawthornden International Writers Fellowship. So I stayed in a castle um, for a month and I. Um, I, it was right outside of Edinburgh. And so after the fellowship was over, I went and I spent <laughs> about 10 days in Edinburgh. And I just like, it was the best time to be there because it was like February. No mm. one was there. There were no tourists and it was gray and rainy. And one day it would snow and the next day it would rain. And, and I just wandered the streets. So I would get up in the morning and have something to eat and wander the streets and come back at dark. And then, you know, and then maybe go to a pub or whatever, and then get up and do the whole thing all over again. And I just, every day, and I felt like I owned the city. It's a very, yeah. it's a very small, you've probably been, right? To Edinburgh? Yeah. No, no, I yeah. actually, that's one place I haven't been, no. Well, it's very, it's a very, it's a very small and knowable city. Yes. I mean, you know, living in New York and, you know, having spent time in London, you know, London's just unapproachable. I mean, it's amazing, but you can't. You can't hold it in your arms. But with Edinburgh, you feel like at the end of, you know, nine or 10 days wandering around, you feel like it's become part of you. And yeah, uh, I love the beautiful. gloom and I love the cobblestones and I love the Scottish people. And, you know, so much of my ancestry is is Scottish. And so I was just like, I was just totally captivated by, by it. And I live in New York where there's no alleys. And Edinburgh is all about alleys. There's just there's alleyways everywhere. They call them close, a close or a wind, depending on how whether they could whether a carriage could go down it or not. That's the difference between a wind and a and a close. Yeah, you know, it's, it could it could have fit a carriage or not. But I just was so blown away by it, and so I came back and I said, well, I've got to write about Edinburgh now. And um, it's like a I, series of yeah. books, right? So I decided yeah. to write thrillers, and I decided to set it in the 18th, in the 19th century, because Edinburgh just it carries its whole history with it. I mean, that's the other thing is like you live in a city like New York, which is constantly rebuilding itself, and yeah, or you, you're getting glimpses of the history, but you're not. You really have to work hard, and you have to yeah. be in certain parts of the town, and other parts are just looking like Disney World. Yeah, but Edinburgh looks very much the way it was hundreds of years ago yes. and it's still you know there's the ruins and the castles and the and and the cobblestones and so i felt like if i was going to write about edinburgh i wanted to write about edinburgh you know 150 years ago so very very cool so it's set it's set in 1880 and also i i chose that because that happened to be the time when conan doyle was in medical school at edinburgh and um I didn't know I was going to bring him into the story, but it turns out he makes a good sidekick to my detective. So, 
Death and Sensibility. Tell us about this one. This one is the pen name is Elizabeth Blake. Yeah. So I, again, more pen names, right? Yeah. So that came about because I was already writing under. So I chose Carol Lawrence because they, uh, my publishers, uh, Thomas and Mercer, wanted a new pen name for the thrillers because it was a new genre, historical thriller. I had never written that before. So they wanted to brand it. So I chose my mother's maiden name, which is Lawrence and uh, my first name. So then they wanted, so then I, with Crooked Lane, I started writing these cozy mysteries. And um, basically the series wasn't even my idea. It was one of the editors there called my agent and she was like, you know, there's this big brouhaha in the Jane Austen Society in England. And there was, there was like what amounts to a knockdown drag out fight between these, you know, these bookish people. And they were just up in arms and they were fighting over these, you know, wh whether how the society was going to go in the future and, and where it should be. And, you know, and so it was getting really nasty and, and they were getting in, in the newspapers. And, you know, Dame Judy Dench was the honorary, you know, president of the society. And so this editor got very interested. She said, well, what if there's a murder? Um, so she called my agent and then I had to audition. I actually had to write some chapters and they, and they picked me to write the series. And so it's set in the Jane Austen society. Now I chose Yorkshire because I happen to love Yorkshire. So, um, even though Jane Austen herself is from the South, of course, um, I chose, I chose Yorkshire. And so that's where it's set. It's set in the, um, it's set in a small market town right outside the Yorkshire Moors. And then this, area actually, there. this book actually takes place in the, in the amazing, talk about amazing historical cities, the city of York, yeah, um, which is the largest city in, in the, in, well, it's a hard. The York northern not, part. Yeah. yeah. It's funny how you're in New York, right? <laughs> yeah, which is so interesting because of course, I'm sure you know that New York was originally New Amsterdam because yes. of the Dutch, right. The Dutch. Um, yeah. Right. So now it's called New York because the British, you know, took it over from the Dutch. Mm -hmm. But um, originally it was New Amsterdam. Exactly and, right. Yeah. So right, exactly. So it's now, and I think the British chose York because maybe because of the Duke of York. Probably not because so much of the city of York because the city of York, you know, it's it's an important city. No, no question about it. But you know. They didn't name it New London. That's in Connecticut. That's so. in Connecticut towards Rhode Island. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Yes. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. So many names uh, that are tied to, they're either English names or mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. are uh, Indian names. In, in yeah. America, especially there's, on the East Coast. Right. There's so the many. Yeah. yeah. And also where I come from in Ohio, there's so many wonderful uh, Indian, virtually not, I don't want to say virtually every county in Ohio, but many counties in Ohio have Indian names. And the same thing is also true in New York. As you know, you know, there are many, many Indian names here. Hello or native, to, we should uh, say Native American, Native people's names. And they're, congratulations. they're so beautiful. Congratulations coming in from Isigari in Barcelona, Spain. Yeah. Oh, that, oh that's another wonderful town. I yeah, love Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. Oh, um, Merlin in place. Canada wanted to know, how do you come up with, how did you come up with the pen names? You mentioned oh, the right. Lawrence. So, so yeah. I chose so C E Lawrence. So C E Lawrence was a weird one. So I chose my mother's maiden name, right, Lawrence, um, and I chose my initials. And this was all because my editor said you want to use initials because the main readers of thrillers and most of those those Kensington uh, books were about serial killers. Uh, the main readers are women, but they like to think that maybe a man wrote the book. And this is not, this is, you know, sort of kinky, really. They, I, I'm writing about men who are killing women and the women are reading about it and they, they want to imagine that the book is written by a man. And so we use the initials CE, which is just my, my name, Carol Elizabeth, and then Lawrence, my mother's name. So it's, it's a really interesting it's a really interesting dance, this whole pen name thing, yes. because it's kind of about genre and reader expectation. And what are they, what are they looking for? You know, and I, I found that really interesting about, you know, what they are imagining the person who wrote it. Of course, you go to my website. It's not a, it's not a secret. Everyone, you know, can find out who I really am. And as far as Elizabeth Blake goes, once again, they wanted, since I was completely changing genres and writing a contemporary cozy set in the uk 
they said, choose, um, you know, uh, you have to choose a pen name. And they wanted something high in the alphabet so that it would be higher, you know, on the book. It would be closer to the beginning. Ah, like they used right, to say that? if like you had little a... weird things that you well, don't Well, that's know. how they used to do it with the yellow right. pages. It, you right. know, if you're going to start a pizza place, call it AAA Pizza. Yes, exactly. You'll go to the A's first. Look right, right, right. So if you open the phone book, you're like, oh, yeah, I'll just go to that one. I'll I go right go to, to the A's. A's. Why would I go to the Z's, right? Right, right. Well, exactly. So, yeah. Right. So I just chose my middle name, which is Elizabeth. And then I chose the last name of one of my favorite poets, William Blake. So that's how Elizabeth Blake came along. Scream Queen Army, Chris, who watches in Northern Ireland, says, Welcome to Lovety Hall, Carol. Please enjoy your stay. Try the dip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm expecting some dip. I heard I heard about your dip, actually. I hear it's very good. Did you get any in the green room? Usually we yes. have dip, champagne, and truffles yeah, yeah. for our guests. Yeah. Was it good? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> uh, Toby in California is asking, are they, are they murder mysteries? That's what she was asking. Uh, yes. Your work. Yeah. Uh, which book? Which book? Toby, Toby was answering, are they murder mystery? Yes. So, yeah. She they're was, all. Um, she's in California. Yeah. But they're, they're different. You know, they're, some of them are cozy murder mysteries, which don't have much violence. Others. Yeah, are what's a cozy different. murder mystery? So uh, cozy. This, I, I've learned a lot about cozy. So a cozy is basically a book with an amateur sleuth, almost always a woman not a professional detective and they have a lot of prescriptions on what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do you're not allowed to have a lot of violence um you don't have violence on stage like maybe a fight i've had i have a couple of fights but like you it tends the, the murders tend to happen off stage um they're not dark in tone they're very light in tone and um, I found out that you're, and you can't ever hurt any children or animals. And I found this out because I was just going to like give a stomach ache to a dog, to a, like a border collie. I was going to have her, you know, adjust some poison, but she got better. And then that helped lead to the killer. But my editor's like, nope, nope, no way. And I said, well, she's not going to die. And they said, nope. I said, not even a stomach ache. They're like, nope, not happening. <laughs> so it's a very, people who, who read cozies, you know, they don't, they they, they don't want full blown sort it's of. It's not dark, right? It's not dark. It's a very, it's a light, it's a light version of murder mysteries, right? So like Agatha Christie, basically yeah, all yeah. of the Miss Marple. You know, if you look at the Miss Marple books, um, they're they're really classic examples. I won't say that that Christie invented the cozies because my knowledge of uh, of the genre is not that deep, but she certainly you know defined it for her era anyway. What is, what is it about, you know, taking a look at the dark side of human behavior that fascinates you? Did you study psychology over the years? What is it about it well, that I, just I uh, actually I actually did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think I think originally I, I came from a lit fic background. So, like, I went to a really uh, conservative school, um, Duke University. And when I was there, we didn't just read dead white males we read like dead white british males it mm. was so conservative and there was i think there was one course on a american history and it was taught by the drama teacher it was yeah. like it was so not it was so not inclusive culturally you know um and and so you know i was sort of like doing a lot of you know reading criticism and doing a lot of that kind of thing and, and reading really conservative things and writing lit i was writing literary fiction but i think when it ca push came to shove i wanted to sell and make money. And um, yeah, I, I, I think any genre can have room for really good writing. I don't think that just because, and this is a comment, this is something I go over with my students a lot. And I always ask the question, you know, do you think that genre fiction um, excludes literary fiction? Do you think it can't, do you think a, a really well-written book uh, cannot exist in genre fiction? And then I see what they say. And I get all kinds of responses about that. But I feel that if something's well written, it's well written, and you know, uh, I, so I like I like the puzzles. I like the puzzle of a murder mystery. It's it's a fun thing to read, and I think it's a fun thing to write. Um, and in terms of the darkness, well, uh, <laughs> I don't know how much I should share really, but my brother was a sociopath, and um, so I got very I you know didn't realize that all of my life, but once I sort of figured out what was going on. I did study criminal psychology at John Jay 
uh, College for Criminal Justice. I had a wonderful professor who, um, Lou Schlesinger, who actually does quite a few TV appearances. And I, I really got very, very interested in sociopathy and serial killers and not just serial killers, because a lot of sociopaths, you know, become CEOs and, uh, you know, lawyers and politicians. <clears throat> Trump. Um, and I think we all know, you know, that uh, we all think of, you know, oh, yes, if someone's a, a psychopath or sociopath, he's a serial. No, he's not necessarily a killer. The vast majority of them are not killers. Uh, the best no, right. and and you know a lot of them live really successfully in society you know yeah. you call you know using other people for your own means successful mm -hmm. but uh it, and i did find it a very interesting uh a very interesting thing to do to to look at that and i i think i think all writers have to be interested in the possibilities of human behavior both bad and good and i think that if you're going to take a deep dive you know into extreme behavior you know, you're certainly going to end up uh, with people who are who are uh, pretty, pretty dark. Pretty dark. Exactly. So right. I, I don't not all of those people appear in all of my books, but I'm I'm definitely interested in in criminal psychology. And I think, you know, the question is, I'm always interested in, like, how did someone get that way? Like, like what I happened was in their life that caused. Yeah. Yeah. And from studying stop. criminal psychology, it seems to me that most of the time things happened in their life. I mean, I, I think most of the time, terrible things happen in people's lives to make them uh, turn out that way. And uh, so that interested me too. That's the story of many homeless too. I mean, That's right. a lot of people, right. <clears throat> some had wonderful lives. Maybe they were professors, they mm -hmm. maybe married with children or whatever. And something happened, something where there was an illness, a death, loss of money, um, a, a nervous breakdown, whatever the case may be. And uh, boy, that's a problem that really needs to be fixed, huh? With all the money we yeah, spend around think, the world, we got to take a look at fixing that right here at home. Cool. Yeah, I feel like our, our country, you know, still, I mean, I think there's still a stigma on mental illness everywhere, but I think it's particularly unfortunate that it's in this country. And, Is that amazing, um, right? Yeah, I was just talking cool. to somebody. I had a guest that's coming on uh sunday and mm -hmm. uh, he was a 90s pop star and, and it was a really cool episode mm -hmm. we have coming up sunday and he's from england from britain and we were talking about mm -hmm. that he's <laughs> he was we were talking about queen elizabeth and all but we were talking about uh the british culture and the american mm -hmm. culture and how you know we talk about all of our freedom and how open and free america is and he said Actually, there are things that you guys are more puritanical about than we are here in Britain. And yeah. when you left us and you didn't want anything to do with us when America, you know, when we left mm -hmm. Britain and all, uh, you took some of our dark, our worst, toughest, yeah, our, puritanical yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. and you brought it over to America. Yeah, and that's what he said. It's kind of true. Like, yeah. Well, and it's also true. You know, I mean, it's so interesting because the Dutch were and are a very tolerant society. And so, you know, even, you know, New Amsterdam, you know, it was a very different society. And then I think what happened was that the people who self-selected to leave England, unfortunately, a lot of them were in fact Puritans, you know, and right there, you know, the Puritanical background that we have as Americans has never done us any favors. And um, in my opinion, um, which isn't to say that, you know, some of the values are, aren't, aren't, aren't good. Certainly a work ethic is good, but I think the puritanical attitude towards, towards human behavior and, you know, that you, you're responsible for everything and, you know, and, or, or, or it's God's will. And that's, you know, that's just not the way it works. And I think that, um, you know, I think the Dutch are a much more enlightened society, uh, unfortunately, and, you know, but we ended up we ended up culturally British. We did not end up culturally Dutch. You know, uh, at least when I say we, I mean us white folks. <laughs> right, so yeah, yeah, I I agree with your I agree with your friend about that. Yeah, yeah, really amazing. And he he's there in England, uh, living it. Uh, here's another one. Tell us about this. Pride, prejudice, oh, so that's and poison. The first, that's the first um, of the uh, Jane Austen uh, cozies. 
Uh, so it's a little play on her her most famous novel, Pride and Prejudice, um, Pride and Prejudice, and I just thought I'd add the poison. So that kind of this kind of a giveaway about what the first murder is. You know, you kind of know you kind of know how she's going to die, <laughs> the first victim. Somebody said they love your covers to your books and your novels. Uh, who designs the covers? Do you have specific people that do the covers? It's all it's all different. Um, it's all the publisher. So whatever the the person who did, uh, you know, the publisher has hired to do it. So, but I know for the Sherlock Holmes novels, Jill Bauman, who's a wonderful artist, she's out in Arizona now. She's done a lot of covers. She did both of my Sherlock Holmes St. Martin's books. Mm. Um, I, I don't know, and I did know her personally because I've been at conferences with her. I don't know who did the the other covers, um, but you notice that you you see you know that this is a cozy. You can tell this is a cozy because there. What suggestion of violence is there? Oh, there's a spilled teacup. Oh, <laughs> you know. So and it's funny because when they first and the room looks very cozy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So you know it's gonna you know from that cover that it's not going to be a disturbing book, yeah. right? Um, yeah. But yeah. the publishers all have um, in-house, mm -hmm. you know, people who do their covers. When um, when you have all the different pen names, do you ever feel a little like Sybil? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I do think the switching from genre. I think when I wrote the first cozies, uh, when I first when I started writing the Jane Austen cozies, I'd been writing thrillers for a while, um, and it was definitely um, a switch. It was definitely a, like, whoa, you know, and I had to I had to really tone down. I had to pull myself back and tone down and not have certain behaviors that that I was kind of used to putting in thrillers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Here's another one. Silent. Slaughter. That's one of the um, that's one of my Kensington thrillers. So that's um, yeah, that's uh, Lee Campbell, who is a, a criminal profiler in New York City. And that's book four of his um, of that series. And uh, he, in fact, is chasing a, a serial killer in this book. There is no criminal profiler on the NYPD when they want to, uh, when they when they need somebody, you know, a criminal psychologist. They just go to one of the many experts, you know, if someone from John Jay or you know one of the other uh, colleges or a criminal. There's a lot of people who are experts on criminal psychology, and so they don't actually have a profiler on staff. But in my fictional world, they do. So. And it's uh, it's Lee Campbell is his name. Mm, really cool. Here's another one too. Cleopatra's dad. Well, that's my most recent. Um, yeah. That's that came out in May. That that was um, uh, that was actually I was really happy to. I got a call from my agent one day, and she said, "I just want to tell you, you can't tell anyone yet, but you're you're." Cleopatra's dagger's been chosen as an Amazon first read. I and love I the said, way you do the voices of the people that you're referring to. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, she's got to be on the down and out. Down, you know, don't tell anyone. Yeah, down low. And, <laughs> yeah, down low, down low for this. And I said, okay, okay, Paige, fine. And she said, no, really, can't tell anyone. And and she said, are, are you glad? And I was like, um, yeah, I guess I am. She said, no, really, you don't understand. You know, people like they lobby for this people. And I, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, I didn't know what an Amazon first read was. I didn't know it was a thing. And so, so it was like, she was telling me and she was like waiting for me to get all excited. And I was like, okay. And then she said, no, let me tell you what it means. And, you know, yeah. and then it's, you know, they put the book up, they, they offer it, you know, to people who are members of the first read, whatever, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, it gets offered a month beforehand. So people get to read it early and um, it, it's heavily promoted. And so it's actually a really nice thing. This is um, a book that is set in New York city in 1880. seems to be a year that I can't get away from, but um, <laughs> I have a, I have a, in this case, I have a young woman who's the protagonist and she is one of the first uh, female reporters um, you know, first professional female reporters in the country. Um, and she's kind of an, she's kind of a proto Nellie Bly type, although she's, you know, operating before Nellie Bly uh, by about a decade. Uh, but she's very, very pushy about, she, they're, they're, they put her on the, they basically have her covering, you know, garden parties and high society and fashion, and she hates it. And so she 
thinks she's witnessed a crime. It turns out she has, but she goes to the editor and, and she basically gets very pushy about, you know, she wants to be a crime reporter. And so she finally gets her way because she did in fact discover, she and her best friend have discovered a body. And, and it's called Cleopatra's Dagger because they actually discover the body in Central Park in the hole that's just been dug for Cleopatra's needle. Now there's, it, you know, probably most people know what Cleopatra's Needle is. It's this big monolith in Central Park. And in 1880, the the monolith was already on its way, but it hadn't arrived. And so they were digging this huge hole um, for it. So I, I said, well, you know, that's kind of fun. Why don't we just throw a body in there? Uh, so it seems like a good place. So she and her friend, Elizabeth and her friend discover, her friend Carlotta discovered this body and that kind of gives Elizabeth the leverage to say, uh, hey, you know, I should really write about this. You know, I mentioned you did improv too early. Do you still do any of that? Do you know, you, I, do, do you I, miss I, comedy? I did. You, I did. You do have a dry wit. You do have a quick timing, which that's my favorite kind of comedy is dry, quick witted comedy. <laughs> well, thank you. I, uh, thank I love you. that. It, 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 after I have a few drinks, it gets much wetter, but uh, dry is good for now. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I do. I have actually, um, right up until COVID, there was this thing in New York called Sunday Night Improv, and it was run by a man named Tom Soder. And it actually had gone, it actually had a history. It had gone back like 25 years, I think, had it existed. And it was, I think it was really down, originally down at the Village Gate. It was run by Jane Brucker, who was someone I performed with um, in at the First Amendment, which is the first improv group I belong to. And um, I think Jane ran it. And then I think Ian Pryor, another of my improv friends, took over. And then finally was taken over by Tom Soder, who ran it for a long time. Various, we had, there's a great theater uptown called The Homegrown. And then we were at the West End. There was a, a Columbia hangout called The West End, which was both kind of famous and notorious for, you know, uh, it was notorious for a certain amount of, um, well, I guess you'd have to say protest behavior. Uh, uh, and unfortunately, The West End is no longer with us. And then Tom eventually moved it to 78th Street Theater Lab. And it was every Sunday night. It was a seven o'clock improv show. And uh, I did it. I did it off and on, you know, for years. And uh, but COVID kind of, it kind of went away in during COVID, and it hasn't yet come back. Mm. But there's a lot of places lot. that have gone by the wayside due to. Yeah. <clears throat> I keep saying that. I know. Uh, it used to be uh, BC meant before Christ. Now it means before COVID. Oh, that's that's a good one. That's yeah. so true. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's changed. Uh... Yeah, it's it, and you kind of like you kind of like go to your old favorite places, or you or you look for them, and you kind of you're kind of like biting your nails, going, "Oh, is that?" Still I hope they're there? still there. Yeah, yeah, we've seen movie theaters close and all kinds yeah. of experiences like that. That's too bad because you know I I know what, people like to watch movies on their phones and iPads and even the televisions, but certain movies if not most i still like to go to the movie theater oh i agree have the with popcorn you. the big screen the yep. comfy chair and the the uh, surround sound and just the experience of it and the communal mm -hmm. nature i'm very communal so the communal nature nature of being in the theater um on the big screen there's just uh, the sound and just the quality of the picture all of it totally different than trying to look at something ah <laughs> yeah, I think you're so right. And, and you know, I think that um, it's it's it is part absolutely partly the communal thing. And it's also partly that larger than life experience right. of like having, you know, you're you're wa you're watching something that is so big, bigger than you. you yeah, feel surrounded by it and immersed in it in a way that even the largest flat screen TV doesn't really doesn't really recapture that, you know. And, and so, you know, you're, you're, you're really a part of that world. And then you have other people around you experiencing it with you, which of course is why I, lo I love live theater so much because of, you know, because there's nothing quite like having an experience with other people. Except you know, for when same... you have that one guy that spends 20 minutes opening up the wrapper of his Snickers bar. Then it gets a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in during England, a love scene too. 
a quiet last love time, scene. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Last time I was in, in a theater in England, which would have been, um, we actually saw an inspector calls down in Hull in, um, in Yorkshire and um, a wonderful, wonderful coastal town. And they have a big theater and they actually had an announcement saying, um, ladies and gentlemen, if you if you have a candy wrapper, could you please unwrap it now before yeah. before it starts? And um, if, you know, oh, sweets. Yes, they, they call sweets. them sweets. sweets. They, candy. Unwrap your sweets now, please. Uh, and it was so funny. They were so specific. Like, don't make yeah. any noise, but unwrap your sweets now. <laughs> <laughs> it's and like so. It's like such specific instructions. Yeah. Like, if you have crumpled paper in your bag and you feel the need to reach for it, reach for it now. Make this one now. If you must pass gas, please do it now. Thank you so much. If there's a fire in the building, the time to exit might be right now. Right. <laughs> yes. Please, please, please alert yourselves to. Yeah. So like, that was that was really cute. But yeah. <laughs> that is funny. Um, composer, musician. Tell us about all that too. And uh, having done work. Uh, at Lincoln Center, which I mentioned in the introduction. Mm -hmm. Cool stuff. Tell us about oh, all yeah, that side that of was, Carol. That's right. Yeah, I, for, I almost forgot about that. Well, um, <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was brought up to, uh, you know, to play piano. My father was a was a professional musician, as well as a teacher. But he, especially later in his life, well, he conducted choirs uh, mm. early in his life. And then um, later in his life, he, he became like um, a cocktail pianist and he really loved, you know, playing parties and gigs and things. So um, I was trained in classical piano and um, I didn't really, th you know, I thought writing music was something, you know, that geniuses did. And like you either were Beethoven or you just played, you know, you played Beethoven, or you played Bach. And um, and then I, I was dating someone who was uh, Anthony Moore. He was a a nephew, a great nephew of the opera composer Douglas Moore, and uh, he taught me how to do ma music manuscript for a musical that he was having done at Yale. He was the composer of a of a Yale school of drama musical, and he taught me how to do manuscripts so I could help him with his manuscript work. And um, I don't know. One day I was just at home and I just like wrote a, a song. And I played it for him. He said, you know, that's that's good. And I was like, what? Really? You know, I was like, what? I don't, you know. And so that was encouraging. Uh, so I just kept writing. And I found that um, I'm more, I was more interested in writing songs that were character based. And since I come from theater and I come from, you know, I went to tons of musicals when I was a kid. And, I, you know, I've been in musicals, um, you know, as an actor, both regionally and professionally. And so, like, I started writing them. And... Um, I started writing musicals and um, they started getting, you know, some readings and, and uh, you know, I did this, I was the featured composer at Lincoln Center. And I, I have, to, I still, it still seems strange because I, I am so in awe of, of the great geniuses, you know, who write music, whether mm. for musical theater or yeah, just yeah. Like, like my man Bach, you know, film I just scores and like John Williams. Oh, and oh yeah. Like some of the best people are right. I think that some of the, best people out there are writing film scores. They're just brilliantly talented people writing film scores. And, and I'm very happy to see there are more women composers now, uh, both serious music and, you know, so-called serious music and film scores or whatever. And um, yeah, so I really enjoy, I really enjoy writing music. It's, um, I'm not a great pianist and I can't always play what I write. So, you know, but I can always find someone more talented than I am to play it. That's the fun can thing about writing. Can you play by ear? <laughs> um, <laughs> I can play a little bit by ear. Yeah. Um, I, I'm better with the sheet music in front of me. Yeah. Um, um, you know, uh, cause that's the way I was trained. I was trained classically, but yeah, but I, I just know technically sometimes the things I write are rather difficult. So I just give them to someone who's better than I am. That mm. makes it easier. Playwright as well, because you have this coming up strings attached. Tell so us that's, about that's a, that's a play about physics and it's, mm. um, I, I don't want to put people off. Really, it's got romance. It's got a little of everything, but uh, it's got you know betrayal. <laughs> it's a love triangle. Um, Sounds like a Lifetime movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does, right? Uh, it was. It's based on a. Um, it's playing off Broadway right now. At, it um, is playing right now off Broadway. Right wow. now, yeah, it's playing at the. Congratulations. Um, 
I'm Theodore Rowe on uh, 410 West 42nd oh, I see. Street. Yeah, the first to the uh, first. Yeah, right. yeah, right. Uh, and um, so it's it's based on a real train ride that took place. Um, and I saw a special about it on called Parallel Universes. It was a BBC, was a BBC documentary. And um, I just thought it was such a beautiful story because it was these three physicists and they were on a train. Um, Bert over at Paul Steinhardt and Neil Turek, who were at a string conference, a string theory conference in Cambridge, and they were on a train going to see Copenhagen by Michael Freyan, which is a play mm. about physics. They were on their way to London to see a play about physics, and they were on a train, which was a metaphor that Einstein uses a lot in describing uh, the theory of relativity, the observer, the train, you know, and the, to, to get those ideas across. So, um, I thought, wow, this, and th what happened on the train on this, in the real story, they came up with a new idea for the big bang, for the origin of the universe. And they came up with this new theory, which supplants the big bang and the, and also postulates the idea of parallel universes. And I thought it was such a great, so wow, that's so, what a beautiful story. Someone should really write a play about it. And I was in my little cabin in Woodstock in the summertime. And I was like, you know, someone should really write about this. And I thought, well, Oh, okay, I'll fine. I'll do it. No one's doing it. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't know how long it was going to take someone to write this play. Were you um, talking to your mirror with that conversation? I was just like, I was just like, someone should write a play. And then I was kind of like, I guess I was ruminating, you know, yeah. ruminating, walking person. around the woods. And I was like, <laughs> well, you're really interested in this. Why don't you just be that Why person? Why don't you do you know, it? I just thought someone needed to do this. Someone needs to write about this. So I wrote this play. Um, and um, actually, the scientists involved, uh, advised me on it, which was awesome. I mean, I called them and they gave me advice and uh, they're really generous with their time, Bert, Bert and Paul. And Paul now is the Albert Einstein chair uh, at Princeton University. And um, Bert is at the University of Pennsylvania and they're both really prominent physicists. And uh, so I wrote this play and um, I didn't know if anyone would go for it, um, but I, I did like this thing called there's an organization in New York called Theater Resources Unlimited, and they have oh, what they sure. call, yeah, yeah producer speed dating, I've right? So yeah. they do these producer speed dates. Yeah. I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to find a producer, I'll I'll go to a speed date. And I went to a speed date, and um, Alexa Kelly of the Pulse Ensemble Theater Company um, was interested. And so uh, that was that was actually not too long before COVID, and and she did some readings. And we worked on the script and then we did some more readings, worked on the script and then, oh, COVID hit. But during, but in the meantime, Alexa had a lot of great ideas about how to improve it. And, and she was really right about a, a lot of the things that she said about it. And so, um, you know, I, I, I suppose I fought back sometimes as one does, but she was like, no, Carol, no, really, you've got to listen to me because actually you've got to be about people, not just science. People don't care. They care about people. I was like, okay, fine. I took almost all of her advice. Um, I get it. I but, love the way you go into character when you're bringing people she's up. She's very British. Like, so I hope she doesn't see me doing imitations yeah. of her. She'll hate yeah. it. Kelly, it was awful. Why did you do that? You don't sound like me at all. Why did you do that? Um, but, um, she's very stern. Um, but she's really, really brilliant uh, as a dramaturg and a director. And and so, you know, we found, and she found, I shouldn't say, I, I had not, I had COVID during auditions. So Did you really? <laughs> yes, so poor Alexa had to go in and audition all these actors. And uh, she found a terrific cast and um, terrific, uh, you know, crew and uh, lighting designer and costume and the the man who does the the um, the sound. He's also a composer. Wonderful. He did a beautiful job, and um, you know, wrote some music, but also did sound design. So I'm I have to say I've I've had things done regionally and I've had things done off 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 Broadway and I've had things done, you know, in readings and but I I've never had you know, so much attention, like it's sort of, it's sort of humbling. You just go into the theater and go, Oh my God, all these people are scurrying around and they've got their little black, you know, outfits on it, got their headsets and they're scurrying around. And, you know, I just went, went Oh, wow. This is like, this is wild. Mm. <laughs> you know? mm. So, so yeah, they're, and the actors are terrific and I just feel very, very lucky. How does it feel to have a play that's uh, off Broadway? 
right now? Well, it the, if, it feels like a lot of pressure. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it really does. But um but it, it feels kind of awesome, you know, too. I mean it's really it, something it, you always gratifying. wanted to do. It was that something that was on yeah, the Yeah, I list? mean I mean yeah, but I, I mean when I was running around, you know, throwing bed sheets over laundry lines, I suppose maybe in the back of my head, I probably didn't even know what it was, you know. I the, probably the thing the thing bed that I had seen was, you know, the local production of the Fantastics with the town lawyer as one of the fathers. You know, that's probably a, a, as much stardom as I had seen. But um, you know, I, I, I don't think I was dreaming that big at a very early age, but I think that, you know, if you write, you certainly want you want an audience, uh, and you want you know, you hope that people like what you've written. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it, it's definitely gratifying, but it, it does, it is also very, I, I won't lie to you. It's very stressful. <laughs> it's <laughs> way more stressful than I thought. You know, I'm like, Oh, every day. Do you do audio books audio at all? Um, I have uh, many of my books are audio books. Yeah. Oh, I mean, do I do them as an actor? Like, no. Yeah. You do narration or voices no, or anything. No, it's a really very good. specialized yeah. skill. It's a very yeah. specialized skill. And I'm I not see you doing it. I, <laughs> I'm not so interested in performing, yeah. um, anymore. I mean, I, I don't mind doing readings for other people and, you know, I, but I don't want to like work too hard. <laughs> I don't want to work too hard. <laughs> oh, <no>. There's so <laughs> many talented performers out there. Um, but doing an audio book, you know, is extremely specialized. Yes, it is. And some really terrific actors, and I won't name names, <clears throat> do not do a good job with audio books. Mm -hmm. Really famous actors, and I've mm -hmm. I've heard them do lousy jobs as uh, audio book narrators because they haven't learned how. And I have a wonderful friend named Paul Liberti, who was in the original cast of um, Of course, of a coach, yeah. Do you know Paul? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's amazing. And so, so I, I learned, I learned what I've learned about how, how much skill it takes through Paul's class because he, he hires authors to come and we don't, you know, they get certain, they get our text and then we go to the class and then each of the actors yeah. in the class works on your text with Paul right. coaching them. And what I've learned from Paul's coaching is just and how incredibly, first of all, how difficult and daunting it is to do it well, just because you're a really good actor and you can do a play, you can do theater, you, know, you can do a movie, doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to be good at audiobook. You better train. You and so train, Paul, right. Right. So Paul trains these people, you know, to do it. And it's so impressive. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to take Paul's class as an actor to even get close to doing, you know, to doing that kind of work. You'd have to be really interested. We're in going to have him as a guest on the show, and hopefully down the line we will. But he's so booked and busy. With oh, good! You're going to have Paul. You're going to have Paul. Well, we were hoping to, but he's so booked with all the classes he's got. Oh yeah, he's constantly right, right. teaching. Oh, he'd so be a great. He'd be a great guest. He's think, so. He is such a. He's one of those crossed. teachers. We'll keep our fingers crossed. If you see him, tell him he's welcome to join. I us. will. I will. I will. He's one of those teachers, and since I teach myself, I, I'm so aware of this. I think he doesn't think he has anything to share or say. And I'm like, oh my God, you have so much to share and say. He's so he's one of those teachers that gives yeah. so much and he pays attention. Like oh, my oh. my I, I would be I was there as like the writer, right? And so they're reading from my work and I'm paying attention, I think. But my <laughs> my mind is starting to wander, and Paul is right on top of everything that they're doing. And I'm so like impressed with how how much attention he's paying and what he sees and what he hears and, and how much he can teach those people and how much he genuinely cares, you know, about the work that they're doing. His, his passion never seems to let up. And again, as a teacher, I have to say, that's, that's amazing. I mean, you, you know, if you've taught, I don't know, have you taught? Actually I have. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, that, that feeling Public speaking of speaking and writing and things of that nature and voiceover stuff. Yeah. Right. And so like, you want to, you want to give every student everything that you can. Right. Right. But it's not so easy. It's, no. you know, every second that you're with them, you know, you want to be, especially if you, you have several in your class. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you want to be, class. you want to be as passionate, you know, you want to be passionate in every, you know, moment. And Paul can do that. And it just, it blows me away. <laughs> like, wow. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. So what are some other exciting things that you have coming up, uh, up your sleeve, Carol? 
Carol, <laughs> C.E., Elizabeth. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a little secret. I wrote, a musical. I, wrote a, <laughs> I wrote a musical that's never going to see the light of day. Really? Um, yeah, because um, it's about Benedict Arnold and the narrator. In the, and, and I have to tell you, it's such a, it's such a tragic story. Um, it's not tragic. I'm really over it. But um, <laughs> the narrator in the story is kind of like a Che Guevara. Did I pronounce his name right? Um, you mm. know, in Evita, you know, yeah, kind of yeah. narrates the story. Yeah. Well, my narrator is Alexander Hamilton. And I swear to God, I wrote this way before, before Hamilton, Hamilton was, came out. Hamilton exclamation mark was, was a thing. And, um, you know, I was really excited about it and, you know, to write about the Revolutionary War. And I got and I learned a lot. And I, you know, and, and Alexander Hamilton was a very, very interesting person, as was Benedict Arnold, um, who's kind of, the, you know, the antihero of my of my story. Um, but like that's never happening. <laughs> First of all, there's no rap numbers, not a single one. You know, hey, hey, Arnold does not step out and say, I'm a badass man and I'm going down. You know, no, none of that, none of that. Go, Actually, no that wasn't too bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's written by a white person, you know, so it's just, not, it's not going to happen. Uh, but it just amuses me. So like it amuses no, it's me. sitting there in the drawer. It's yeah. sitting, I've had readings of it, you know, Have you? I've had readings of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I also have a musical about, well, I have a Sherlock Holmes musical and I have a musical about Rasputin that I'm working on. And I've actually, I actually have completed a musical about uh, the House of the Seven Gables. It's just oh, a wow. pretty much a straight up a adaptation of Nathaniel Hawthorne's um, House of the Seven Gables, which I think has a claim to being the great American novel. Um, it's probably, probably, it's really the great Gatsby, but I think that, um, I think the House of the Seven Gables is a pretty amazing book. I really do. And, um, you what know, I, I just think you? it should be a musical. So, be a so musical. I wrote one. <laughs> so you wrote one. What, what inspires you to write and to come up with the stories? And, and what do you, are there certain periods, genres, societies, different things that you just gravitate to or you open to everything and anything? Yeah, it's any, you know, it's really anything. Uh, I, I, yeah. And it, I mean, obviously... I mean, I am very much inspired by real life. Yeah. You know, I'm a devotee of true crime, for example. I, I, I'll watch I'll watch any show about true crime, um, though I some are definitely better than others. Um, but like with, you know, with the physics um, play, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a science and nature geek. I mean, I like to wander around the woods and I really like science. I'm not very gifted at it, but I love reading about people who are and I like to read you know, books by scientists and, and doctors. And, you know, I like to read books by that kind of expert. And I have a lot of those books, you know, in my library. Um, so, you know, it was natural for me to be, you know, attracted to a, a real life story that involved physics. Um, though, again, I, I don't have a lot of uh, talent, but I think I'm someone who can take those things and, you know, from the people who are really gifted and then maybe make it more accessible to the, you know, the average person. Um, so that interests me, but yeah, why I got, I don't know. I just got very interested in Nathaniel Hawthorne um, because I, I, I don't know. I was running around Newport, Rhode Island on a cloudy mm. day. Cool and, place, um, isn't it? It's an amazing town. And one day we, um, we finished a walk, a long walk on a wintry day and we were free. Our fingers were like frostbitten. Mm -hmm. They weren't, but they were really cold. We've and we in walked too, into this yeah. place called the White Horse Tavern. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which it turns out is one of the oldest uh, taverns in the country. Yes. And we walked in and we ordered rum toddies at the bar. And we were then informed by everyone there that it was haunted. It was really haunted. And mm. they took us around. And because it was late and there was no one around, they took us around and they showed us the haunted you know, dining room. This is really haunted. And so I, I think I, was, I got very interested in the idea of haunted New England. And of course, House Salem, of the Seven Massachusetts, and yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. House of the Seven Gables takes place, you know, in haunted New England, and it's about a haunting, and the you know the house itself is haunted, but but the haunting is also a metaphor for you know the evils of you know basically white people in America. You know, there's a Mar there's a Martin Mull movie by that title. I don't know if you know it. Oh, white yeah. people, in America. it's hilarious. It's so you funny. My favorite scene is where they come down and they. Well, they come down and they each have their own proprietary jar of mayonnaise 
And they're like, I'm out of mayonnaise, Junior. Can I borrow yours? And it's like, oh, gosh, Mom, I don't know. You have to ask, uh, you know, Edna. Edna, do you have more mayonnaise? Oh, yeah, I think I do. And this is like, it's like I, 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 I killed myself laughing because that was my family. Like we would have, we didn't have our own proprietary mayonnaise jars, but we could have. You could I have. I feel more morally nailed, nailed white people. But I, I, um. Do you have a devil and paranormal or any of that world too? I like that. I like that very, very much. I'm starting to watch my, you know, we all have a guilty pleasure. For some people, it's the Kardashians. No, I've never seen that show and I'll never see it. For other people, it's, there's a show called Project Runway, I guess. Um, I've never seen that. I'm not interested in runway or fashion. But um, there's this show called the Gym Masters Show Live that I hear is really good. <laughs> and you can binge watch almost 800 episodes that they've done. It's amazing. That's, that's it's a amazing. cool place to make it sort of your fetish. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You get to be yeah. a lovity too. <laughs> a lovity. So I so the my guilty pleasure is watching paranormal uh active uh, paranormal caught on camera. You ask about you Do know, you ever paranormal. feel you ever experienced any yourself? I've had some really strange psychic experiences. Standing um, in the I've line had, at the DMV or I've had <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That would drive anyone. Yeah, I've had some um I've had some experiences where someone was about to die and uh and my sisters have had the same thing. And you had um, some and allegedly my grandmother was very psychic. Um so Did you have I mean a dream before or something? Yeah, I mean so stuff like that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I've had prophetic, right. So I've had that stuff and I've had friends who have had that stuff. Um, but I don't necessarily believe it. I just find it really, really fun to like, you know, imagine it. Um, I've never actually seen a ghost, but if you watch paranormal activity, a uh, paranormal caught on camera, you'll see some pretty amazing footage, uh, of, of people, of, you know, of what looked to me very much like spirits and tons and tons of poltergeist activity, amazing poltergeist activity. And some of it's caught on security cameras. And like the people who are involved don't even want their names, you know, they consent to, to have the, the, the footage on the show, but they don't want their names involved. So they're not looking for publicity. So there's some pretty convincing stuff there. And I have written a little bit of horror fiction. My first published short story was um, called Miracle at Shamayo. And it was about, it was about a young boy, a young Latino boy in New Mexico who basically, um, it's kind of kind of like a New Mexican version of the Earl King. He goes mm. to the sanctuario, the famous sanctuario, to get some healing dirt for his friend who is sick, and he and he's visited by death in the woods. And the ghost of his father comes along and, and vanquishes, you know, vanquishes the ghost, vanquishes death, so that the little boy can complete his journey. So that's that's a that's a horror story. So I've written a, I've written a little bit in that genre, and mm. I like I love really good horror. We just lost our. Uh, we just lost a wonderful Peter Straub uh, about a week ago. He died. One of the greats. Mm. I mean, wow. Yeah. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like Spielberg? Do you like? Yeah, I do. Well, who doesn't like? I mean, Spielberg. He's he's so amazing. I mean, well, what range he has? The only other director I can think of that has the kind of range he does is Billy Wilder. I mean, Billy mm. Wilder could do anything, and I feel like Stephen. I, I I feel like Spielberg can do anything i mean you can succeed in any genre it's 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 amazing um i do like stephen king um i uh i i've i've not read a lot of his books but i was very taken by um the one see i always forget the name of it it was the one they made a movie with chris walken um the uh, i always forget the name of it I could Google it. But anyway, um, I was very taken with that novel. Do you know which one I'm talking about? Yes, I can picture it. You want to phone a friend? <laughs> yeah, wait. I can't. Tony. Tony, what was the book? Oh, you, have I, actually, Tony? you have a Tony? I do. Hey, Tony. What? Like, Tony, you're Tony. 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 Tony, what's the name of that book? I'll take a oh, slice. Stephen King. I'll take a slice of pepperoni. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I'm, I'm looking. Um. I'm, I'm you like Quentin up. Tarantino and uh, any of those folks? Uh, not so much. George Lucas. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm the definitely. I'm stuff. definitely. A, I'm definitely a sci-fi nerd. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I like certain sci-fi um, movies that like are famously bad. Uh, like I really like Cloud Atlas. Do you know that one? Did you like the Poseidon Adventure, Towering Inferno, and Earthquake? I, I, I do like disaster movies. Disaster. I think they can be really fun. Yeah. But I yeah, mean, I bring really... out all the stars too. Fred Astaire and like all of the uh, old Hollywood would always be in those. Lorne right, Green. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Right, right. right. <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm looking at. Wait, Are you I'm Googling at... uh, for that name? Okay, Stephen King, Chris Walken. Yeah, I can't. I oh, I can never remember the. I can never remember this. The, the dead zone. There you go. It's oh, the dead yeah. zone. How could yeah. I forget? Yeah. It's a really, it's a really interesting book, and and also some, you know, some other books that I think have, uh, you know, have made their authors famous, and you know, maybe people don't take that seriously because they're horror. I really liked uh, Interview with a Vampire. I thought it was terrific. Um, and I thought it wasn't, you know, I thought it, again, I thought it transcended the genre of, you know, horror. If if you think the genre needs transcending, I'm not sure it does. But, um, I mean, after all, you know, Edgar Allan Poe, <clears throat> who is who is our, our mascot, uh, I want to say our mascot, but he's sort of the patron saint of yeah. mystery writers of America. And, uh, you know, his, his thing was horror. It wasn't really mystery, it was horror. And Nathaniel Hawthorne was writing horror half of the time. Now, do you like... Oh, do you, do you, I was going to say, do you prefer, you know, some people like sort of Texas Chainsaw Massacre slash. No, I don't like that stuff. stuff. I don't and like. Um, some like the Twilight Zone, Alfred Hitchcock psychological thrillers. Ooh, what could be behind the door or what's under the bed or, you know, what is he thinking? I love the, I go more of the psychological thrillers. The yeah. things like the Twilight Zones and all those where things happen to ordinary people that actually can happen or they reveal how people treat each other and how mm -hmm. society treats each other. And <clears throat> and there are always these stories that you can relate to because they're yeah. about our lives and the Hitchcocks yeah. and like all that kind of stuff. Uh where they, it just draws you in. You don't need to have stabbing and blood and everywhere. Matter of fact, I would yeah, prefer, I don't, that. I don't, I don't prefer like not a having any of that. Uh, I'd rather just more of the, you know, like the ABC movie of the week. Remember all of yeah. those? Oh, I just, <laughs> those yes, yes, yes like of course. Thrillers, like, yeah. Oh, I just see that Sherry, I just, I wish I had been watching the chat when I was trying to come dead up zone. with that title. I see that Sherry actually came up. Thank you, Sherry. Yes. She came up with the dead zone. Thank she you, got Sherry. dead zone. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't scrolling. I had the chat up, but I wasn't scrolling down enough. That's because you were Googling. Thing. You can't Google and scroll. Yeah, I was Googling. I was Googling. I was <laughs> Googling, Googling the zone, but Sherry actually knew what it was. Yeah, well done. Well done. Well done, you, as they say in England. So, well done, you. Well done, you. Uh, yeah. That was brilliant. And I agree with that you. was bloody I, brilliant. I, <laughs> bloody brilliant. It was bloody brilliant. It was brilliant. But, you know, like a cup of tea is bloody brilliant. I mean, it basically, brilliant is a catch-all word for everything. Yeah, yeah, and you give someone like a, you like hand someone a crumpet or something. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, is it really, though? I haven't tried it yet. I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> no, I agree with you about. Um, I pr much prefer um, psychological psychological horror to like. And, uh, like who I don't do you like? like what, who are the who are the people that you always admired and that uh, inspired you through the years? Oh gosh, you, you mean in general? I mean, yeah. the list is too long. I, yeah. I, I mean, when I was a teenager, I was. I loved I loved Ernest Hemingway and I loved James Agee and oh God and you know Edna St. Miss and Millay, Edith Wharton, um, Catherine Ann Porter. Um I mean it's like so many, so 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 I mean it's it's I love Tolstoy. I love the Russians. Um I, I, I love Russian literature, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and and, and, I, and I love the, I love, I, I double majored in German. So I read a lot of German writers like Bertolt Brecht and Gunther Grass and Heinrich Bull. And, and I love the, I love the, both the 18th, you know, and I read Goethe and I read a lot of class, I read a lot of classical literature and, 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 and I, I really adore all those authors. Um, what do you think of a movie? Cause it has a thriller aspect to it. Um, Whatever happened to Baby Jane? That's so. <laughs> John Crawford. And, uh, 
yeah. <laughs> it's my father yeah. when my when, when I was Davis a kid when I was a kid before I knew what that was right I remember my father accused one day he said um he said well he said to my mother and and my aunt Jane he said well you two are Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, aren't you? And my mother just looked at him and said, well, I hope I'm Betty Davis. <laughs> and I didn't even know what that was. Like, I'm like, huh, I know those names. But but then I later I saw that movie. And you and saw the I movie, yeah. yeah. I don't know yeah. you'd really want to be either one of those people in that movie. <laughs> I don't <laughs> No, it's, uh, yeah. I it's remember a, reading, I forgot who wrote it. And it was a thriller, too, and it was kind of cool. Um it was called The Fan. I don't know if you ever read that, The Fan. Oh, it was about right. this, this fan who was obsessed with this actress. And a matter of fact, I believe it or not, it was, I saw it in a Reader's Digest condensed book series that uh -huh. my mother used to have delivered to the house. And it was The Fan. And it was riveting, the way it was written. Just You don't it, remember who wrote it? Maybe I you're... you're who maybe wrote you're, it. But your followers in your chat will know. It was called the fan. Yeah. When was it? Written? When was it written? Uh oh, oh boy, I read it probably twenty years ago at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, at least that. Um, well, there was the there is the Stephen King book about you know the author being kidnapped by by his fan, uh, which just made him into a movie with Kathy Bates. And, right. Um, who was the who was who played the writer? It wasn't Brian Cox. I want to say it was someone like Brian Cox, but mm, mm. I don't remember. Yeah, but it was made into a movie. Yeah. Um, I've heard of this one, but ha they haven't made it into a movie, the one you're talking about? The fan where the um, actress is sort of being stalked with these yeah, mysterious yeah. letters yeah. that keep coming. Yeah. and that ha I mean, that I, I don't have stuff to happens you. in real life, too. Yeah. yeah, it happens a lot. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, where people where people get, get mm -hmm. stalked. You know, mm -hmm. and not just writers and not just actors, but, you know, just everyday people. Yeah. Yeah. Athletes get stalked. Yeah. Talk show hosts get stalked. They do. Remember David yeah. Letterman was stalked? Yes. Right. Right. Watch out. Watch Merlin out. says Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte was one of her favorites. Oh, yeah. A misery. There you go, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry. Misery. It was misery. The Stephen yeah. King was misery. You know who's enjoying this conversation? Somebody that pops in towards the latter part. Mr. George Burns is with us. Oh my God! He needs Gracie <laughs> Allen. Actually, that's the, that's the movie he was in. Oh my God! Remember? That's, that's right. I do remember. That. I was they, doing you totally won a prize. Cool. You win a yeah. dinner yeah. with Tony and George. <laughs> George is buying. That's a great looking puppet. It, does, it, does he? Does, it, he this, does he move? It's actually a uh, collectible doll. He's on a stand. Oh. He's, you know, he's got the feet and the shoes and the whole really bit. Nice this is a collectible uh, that's not even supposed to be, I'm not supposed to be really touching it. My aunt collected dolls oh. and it got passed down to me. Uh, and this, I think when he turned either 99 or I think he mm -hmm. made it to 100, mm -hmm. they had a limited edition of these and he's got the cigar and the red hanky. So he pops up towards the latter part and he said, he thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. You knocked it out of the park and he learned so much. And Thank you, a, George. He's a big fan of your work. <laughs> Thank you, George. I'm, I'm, well, I'm big, I'm a big fan of your work too, George. Keep it, keep it, uh, keep it going. He says, is, is that a piano behind you there? I think he's yeah, that's my thing piano. That's one of my one one of my pianos, yes. You have more than one in the house? Yeah. I, I have two pianos in my apartment. Um <laughs> And then I have one up in the Ankrum Opera House in uh, uh, upstate New York that my father left to me. And my mother was like, sell it, sell it. You get some money. And I'm like, I'm not selling <laughs> sell it. I am sell not it. selling my father's piano. And that's not <laughs> happening. Even though, you know, I was fairly poor at the time. But um, so I, so it's, it has its temporary home in the Ankrum Opera House, which is a lovely, lovely place. They do shows, oh, they terrific, do public huh? classes, they do all kinds of things. Why do so, you love doing what you do? Why does it bring uh, you, you know, great blessing and joy? Because it really beats working for a living. Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, I have to say, I, I see people out there. I mean, I was driving up to, um, oh, thank you, Mar thank you, Marilyn. She said, uh, Marilyn's saying thank you and bye, thank you. Oh, yeah, um, these are our levities, yeah. I was, I was, um, I was driving uptown to pick up my friend who was going for a minor surgery in the hospital. And I was on the FDR and I came off 
this is the, the east side drive and i came up and there was a woman with a baby strapped to her back selling mangoes and bottles of water along you know walking between the cars that's you know that's, that's what she that's was true. doing on that morning to you know try to get a dollar. and anytime yeah. i start feeling sorry for myself you know, say, oh, you know, I have all these deadlines. Oh, it's so stressful having a play done. Oh, you know, I have to do this interview. Oh, I'm too tired. You know, really, like, get a grip. Just, you know, just visit the like, water of a children's I, hospital or, yeah. yeah I'm, no, I, I mean, I and, and I, I said it, you know, beats working. But truly, truly, I think the people who are, you know, we learned who the real heroes are during COVID. We learned, we learned who they were. And, um, you know, they were the the hospital workers, the essential workers, the people who went to work every day with the with the promise of death, you know, in front of them, and they still did it. And they're the people. Yeah. Who, yeah. They're the people who I want to write about next. I mean, I actually want to write a book with my little sister about ER nurses. Unfortunately, a beautiful book just came out about ER nurses. So I, I you know, I don't know. I haven't been. Things. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Somebody's I'm beating you to the punch on a few of these things. Yeah, but it's, such have, a, it's your a topic I've wanted to write about for a long, long time. Is your apartment bugged? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it. you know, it makes sense that people would want to write about this. And those are the people that I just, I just absolutely admire them, you know, just more than I can even express what yeah. my little sister does every day and what those people like her do every day really amazes me. But why, I don't know why I, the, the only answer I can come up with about why I, why I like to write is I like stories. Yeah. I I'm addicted to story and I'm addicted to narrative and I always have been. And, and I guess I found that it was easy to, it, that it was attractive to me to make up stories. And my parents are both great storytellers. So it kind of came by it naturally you know, and yeah. and so I guess that's why I do it because I just I love hearing stories and I love telling stories and I think, you know, it's really interesting because my artist friends, my graphic, you know, I have some friends who are quite successful painters, and they think in a whole different way. They're they're not addicted to narrative, and um, it's so interesting to me. I think my brain is just hardwired that way. Like I'm just a, I think I'm just hardwired to want a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, and, and yeah, you know, yeah, I just, yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. just, it, it just yeah. interests me. Do you me. like I, your music that way? Do you like your music, your songs that you listen to, to have a beginning, you know, middle and end, or do you like where there's, where they just riff and it's all like you jazz? Know what's really interesting is I'm, I'm a big fan of minimalism. Some of my, my favorite composer, my favorite living composer is actually John Adams. And, um, uh, or my, I shouldn't say my very favorite because there's so many that I love so much, but um, one of my favorites is John Adams and he's very much a, min a minimalist and I like Steve Reich. I like Philip Glass. I like, I like the, I like the kind of the, um, oh, and Arvo Perrot, the, you know, the Estonian composer, he's definitely not linear. And um, uh, Morton Lauritsen, well, he's more, a little more traditional, but some of my f favorite people writing today are, they're not linear at all. They're very, you know, very contemplative. And I, I'm very attracted to that. I'm very, because I'm so linear, I think I'm very attracted to the way contemplative people think and paint the way painters think, you know, it's a more dreamy kind of all inclusive way of thinking. And it's, it's not so linear and it's not so narrow. And I really, I really love that. So I, no, I, I, question. Yeah, I do like, I do like non-narrative music a lot. No, 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 no. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I, sure. I, I also, you know, I love my man. Yet yeah, JS, JS Bach. I, uh, I can't get enough of him. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, Kathleen in New York City says, "Just curious, why do authors use different names on their books?" But you, it's oh, different genres. You have genres to watch the you, show right? now. You have to watch the She's show. Just got to rewatch the whole thing. <laughs> you got to rewatch the whole thing. Rewind it and watch it at the beginning. Um, but, your, but your answer, but the quick but answer, Maureen Kathleen, is too, I guess. it, it, it has to be. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I forgot to mention too that um, that some really, really famous writers that you've heard of use pen names for their other genres, and I will throw a couple names out there. Anne Rice, who sadly died, uh, also wrote different genres other than horror. She used a pen name. Stephen King uses a pen name for his work that is not horror writing. George Carol Oates writes. Um, I think I'm not sure if it's romance, but she writes genre that isn't literary fiction. She is writes under a pen name. J.K. Huh. Is it so people that know that name with that genre? That's right. It's bra it's branding. It has to do with what we now call branding. That person and that name, right? Right. 
Right. Right. Would you and J.K. Rowling is another one who writes uh, under a completely different name. She writes under a man's name, I believe. Um, and so it has to do with it's all about branding. I mean, the short answer, Kathleen, is that it's about branding. It's yeah. about what it's reader expectations. So so like if 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 a reader buys a Carol Lawrence book, they, they're going to expect a historical thriller. Right. And it would throw them off, you know, if it were like something, you know, J.D. Robb, Nora Roberts. Uh, and Nora, Sherry says J.D. Robb and Nora Roberts. That's that's what is Nora Roberts right, Sherry? Do you know? I don't know. I mean, I know what she writes. I know what she writes as Nora Roberts, but I don't know what she what her pen name is. Hmm. So, yeah, it's just really branding. It's the branding. Yeah. Right, right, right. It's cool stuff. It, yeah. And I, I, I never know. Yeah. I never know what what pen name is going to come next. Are you always writing? Are you always? Or well, do you have times where or you I'm ru- or I'm ruminating it? or I'm ruminating yeah. right now. I'm I, right now. I'm a little burned out, to be quite honest with you, because yeah. I was I, t- I had to write two books in one year. And then as soon as I turned in this, the, the book, as soon as the book came out, Cleopatra's Dagger, this play went into production. And so like. Uh, or at least it went into pre-production and my producer, you know, was talking to me about it. So, so I, uh, I'm just, I'm a little wet. I'm a, I need to step away and just like, let something percolate. When ideas come, it's like percolation. Like you're just like, I need just time where I walk around in the woods and I just like, just totally detach from it. Right. Me too. Totally detached from the idea of, you right. And you know, I think think it's really, I actually don't. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think people who say, I think people who believe and who say that you have to write every day are giving really, really bad advice. And I think that if you feel you have to write every day, you're not stepping back enough. Then it's like an assembly line, like a factory. Yeah. Yeah. You're not it's stepping. Draining. And maybe, you know what? Maybe there's some people, I hear there's some writers who do that. Good for them. Yeah. You know, there's some days when I don't want to be near a computer, a pen, a piece of paper. I just want to be rooting around in the woods like a nature truffle and I just want to be like rooting in the dirt and walking around and I yeah. just or on the tennis court or whatever. Right, exactly. Yeah, I can't I I you know. So so People no, I'm not you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't write every day. Not every and day. And I'm not always working on a project. How about in music? Are you still dabbling in music? I'm I play I try to play the piano every day. And um I, I worked as a professional singer when I was doing, you know, a lot of acting. And so I'm, I, I'm, sometimes I sing, you know, uh, along when I'm playing, it's hard to play and sing though. People who do it really well are amazing because it's, it's really hard, but um, uh, I'm always, I'm always doing some form of music. I haven't written, and sometimes I do little improvs um, on the piano, but I haven't actually written a song for quite a while. And that's making me very sad because I need to, uh, I need to exercise those those muscles. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But it's just been too much else going on. Everything, the whole world going on. I know, absolutely. Well, this has been fantastic, my Thank friend. Thank you. This Thank you so been, much for having me. You know, we chatted an hour and a half. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Time for some sushi. Sushi. I got sushi waiting. <laughs> do you really? Uh, I do actually. Yes. Tony yes. has sushi waiting. Tony, yes, Tony. You can bring out the sushi now. Thank you, love. Brilliant. <laughs> brilliant. The sushi's brilliant. It does look a little bit like you're in a British flat, you know. You oh do yeah. Have I, I definitely have an old world. I have an old world vibe. My parents, my parents both were like old world vibe. That yeah. was their that was like their look, and that's definitely my look. It's like yeah. I'm definitely like I could be my apartment could be an Edwardian men's club, basically. That's the look. What about a speakeasy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, like I actually had a friend walk in one time. We were we were doing one of we were rehearsing a, a reading in one of my musicals, and she walked into the bedroom and she said, "Oh, how lovely! You have whorehouse lighting." <laughs> and I'm like, it's just a lamp. It's not Don't really a whorehouse. It's not really you know. But like this lamp, you know, this yeah. is definitely you know. I buy things at yard sales. Like this lamp is from a yard sale, you know, uh, in Woodstock. You know, it's like it's got tassels. I like things with tassels, you know, I got, I got like a pair of lamps for $10 at a yard sale. You know, that's the way I like to shop. There's a lot of deals and bargains. People don't know what they're getting yeah. rid of sometimes. Yeah. You know? I don't understand people who hire, you know, someone else to design the place that they live in. Like I can't figure out what my place should look like. So I'm going to, I'm going to, 
hire someone to tell me what I, you know, what my look is. I'm like, huh, I don't even get that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Just do you know? it, right? Just, Just do, do it. it. Like either you like lamps with tassels or you're one of those people who likes those boring old white rooms. Fine. Go for it. You know, whatever. <laughs> but like don't hire someone to tell you that. It's a, I, I found that I find that like, Oh, it creeps me out so much. I shouldn't say that. Cause I probably should have salted like everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you're but right. thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. It was delightful. Yeah. I, 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 I always say, I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I have with you, Carol. Oh yeah. You were wonderful. You were, you're, you're just a terrific interviewer and you're such a, such a, you ask such great questions and you know, I really appreciate your great listener and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. And as my dad has always said, whenever anybody says something nice or kind to you, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. That's I it. I say that all the time on the yeah. phone. Yeah, that's it. I say that when I'm a particularly good customer service person, I, I say, tell your boss I said to give you a raise. Yes. I don't know if that ever happened, but I you know. C.E. Lawrence.com. And uh, of course, you can find the works at Amazon and all the usual places where books are. Right? And off Broadway so, for, for uh, until the end of the month. Yes, which is really. <laughs> what theater? Office. What theater is it at? It's at Theater Row. So the name it of the theater is Theater Row. Theater yeah. Row. It's That's a great place. Yeah. West Been there many times. And it is great. It's a lovely theater. Right there in it's Manhattan. Really nice and really well air conditioned, which was so lovely during rehearsals. During. Like so comfortable. Congratulations on Strings Attached. Yeah. Thank you so I'm much. North Broadway. Very, very cool. We'll keep the porch light on for you, Carol. You're welcome Thank back you. anytime and spread the word for us. Uh, let everybody know. Know about sure, the yes. I, show series. I went. I I will. I did. I'm going to do another round of social media tomorrow. Yeah. Fantastic. And our friend John Coons too, who we know yeah. too, who's a character and a lot of fun, and uh, enjoyed him. He was a guest on the show as well. And yeah. uh, you be well, my friend. You take care. Thank and you. Uh, thank you so much. Lovely to meet you, a fellow you Brit, a fellow, yeah, a fellow. Uh, 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 what is a UK Islander? Yes. Uh, Cheers and slancha. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Right, it was truly brilliant. Yes. All right, take care. Now time for a spot of tea. <laughs> right, sushi and tea, perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye -bye, Bye -bye, now. Bye bye. A lot of fun and a lot of mystery, suspense, and uh, thriller. Uh, that was really cool, huh? Carol. Rugay was with us, suspense novelist, author, composer, musician, performer. She's even done improv and all kinds of good things. She's got sushi waiting for her. Uh, she's terrific. Came to us uh, live from New York City. Yeah. And uh, we had a good time. Now, we just showed these are just a few of her works, just a few. Many. She's been writing for years. And also, again, a musician, a composer as well. This is the off-Broadway play that's happening at Theater Row in New York City. Very exciting for Carol. Congratulations. A lot of other books. And the names to look for, of course, Carol's name, but also Carol Lawrence, Elizabeth Blake. Yeah, there's Carol Lawrence. C.E. Lawrence. Elizabeth Blake, those are all Carol's work. Yeah, all of these are Carol's work and much, much more. Hope you guys enjoyed it. This was fantastic. Mona watching in New Orleans. Yes, good to see you, Mona. Great show tonight, Jim. Very interesting lady. Yeah, she sure was, right? Multi-talented person on many different levels with a great dry wit you know what I love? <clears throat> you know what I loved is the fact that she did. I loved it so much. I'm all choked up. Uh, she did all those different voices when she was saying, yeah, and my cousin and the lady over here and this one over. She then transformed into that person. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was very funny. Like she was doing their voices as she was talking about different people in her life. I think that's funny when people do that. I think it's cool. Uh, it's, she's performing, you know, like, it's like performance art right before our eyes here. Good to see you, Mona. And, uh, and everybody watched, uh, and everybody watching that is uh good show. Good show. 
as they say in Britain. Have a wonderful rest of your evening, Jim and Lovety. Sending tight Lovety hugs to each of you, to you as well, Maureen, and everybody watching. Kathleen in New York City. Thanks, Jim. Great show. And everybody, you guys are the best. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to watch that Norman Lear special celebrating his 100th birthday. Yeah, for those watching right now live, that's tonight on ABC at 9 o'clock Eastern. Uh, it's going to be epic. And uh, Greg Field, the eight-time Grammy-winning composer. And, uh, of course, remember Monica Mancini was on our show. Greg Field was on. Their husband and wife. She is the daughter of Monica Man of uh, Henry Mancini. Monica is the daughter of Henry Mancini. If you didn't see that episode, it was an incredible episode. Greg Field did the music for tonight's ABC special celebrating 100 years of Norman Lear. <clears throat> it's his it's his birthday. One happy birthday, Norman Lear. All in the family, the Jeffersons, Maud. I mean, one day at a time. Think about all the series that he's responsible for, all the laughter over the years. Norman Lear, God bless you. Here's to 100 more. Thanks for the laughs. Thanks for all the comedy. One of the best in television and in comedy, Norman Lear. Thanks, Mona. You, We appreciate when you're here. You're always, uh, you're always having a good time with us. Gang, thanks for being with us. Jim Masters here thanking you for your time this time till next time. We don't say uh, goodbye. We say see you later. Ciao. Cheers. Shalom. Slancha. Abida Zane. Hasta la vista. <laughs> Sayonara. Moilu. And take care and be well. Don't forget to love one another. Take care of one another. And be good to yourself. Take time for yourself. That's so important. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. That's right. There's a thumbs up icon on our YouTube channel. And before you go, leave a comment on our YouTube channel. Yes, please. That helps us. That helps the uh, algorithm at YouTube because when you leave a comment, more people get to see the episode. That's right. So when you click thumbs up, like, and you leave comments for us on the channel, that helps our series grow, the show that you love so much. We thank you. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. There's that button right there. The big red button, just hit that. There's no cost. You'll be a part of the JMS Lovety family when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the notification bell so you never miss any of the episodes. We'll be back tomorrow. We've got a lot of great guests, so many extraordinary guests that are coming on. And uh, it's going to be absolutely amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, my birthday is this Saturday, so we're looking forward to celebrating with family and friends this Saturday, September 24th. That's going to be fantastic for the birthday, so we look forward to that. Uh, but we'll see you on the next episode of the Gym Masters Show. We will be here with and for all of you. Take care, gang. We love you all. Be well. See you on the next episode of the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series. It's a mouthful. You don't have to remember all that. Just remember the Jim Masters show right here on YouTube at Jim Masters TV. <laughs> Take care. Cheers. <laughs>